to a new session of AI Guild. Today, we have Amit Badlani with us, who is currently leading enterprise AI products in NVIDIA. So he's been working with robotics, automation, space, and healthcare, along with smart cities. Thank you so much for being with us here, Amit. Uh, I heard that you also hold double master's degree from Stanford University, along with master's of sciences in engineering, along with product design. So I'm, I'm really glad to have you here. And most of all, we're going to be talking about a really, really fascinating topic of federated learning. This has not been spoken a lot about, and this is still a topic much towards uh, research. So what we see these days is with, with companies uh, trying to develop better AI models and lack of data, or I would say that companies have very um, minimal data or limited data only available in their domain. That's where we would like a technology like federated learning, where we are able to collect and curate data from multiple sources, which gives us more of a holistic view of data coming from that particular industry. So Amit is going to be talking about how federated learning techniques can be used in enterprises and how that will be useful to accelerate the AI products that we have. Thank you so much for being with us, Amit. Uh, if there's anything that you would like to add about your role or anything that you're working on currently, please do so. No, thank you so much. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and you know share all the things that I've learned, uh, especially in the field of uh, federated learning and AI with uh, engineers and designers who might want to learn more about this field. I think you nailed the intro, so thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just gonna um, I'm just gonna like add more details uh, to uh, you know how this field is evolving and give you guys an introduction into how we are using it in the enterprise world and then from there we can um, take any questions you might have and then also talk through some challenges because it is a very promising technology um, and while it's in research it's actually being used on a daily basis uh, you know informing most of the enterprise ai products but uh, there are a few challenges i would like to talk about as well so we'll take the uh, last five to ten minutes to talk through that so with that um, i'll just go ahead and share my screen um, and hopefully you okay. all can hear me fine and see this yeah so, so by the time we have your screen on here uh, it would be great if the audience can mention where they are joining in from, which state, which country, where are you tuning in from? We have about uh, 80 viewers right now. So just put in the chat, where are you tuning in from? Great. So yeah, we have your presentation on here. Yep, we can see it, Amit. Awesome, awesome. Okay, cool. So um, I am uh, joining live from um, San Francisco out here. There's a few things I'm going to be sharing about that are particular to the urban environment when we talk about you know use cases in enterprise AI, uh, which are to do with like smart cities or self-driving. Um, but uh, I know that some of you around the world can actually drill really it especially you know certain urban environments and even like the post pandemic world with uh, you know healthcare which we are going to dive into uh, later in the presentation as well so um, the agenda for today is going to be very simple uh, i'm going to talk about how we are accelerating enterprise ai um, how integrated learning fits into the whole piece and how it can help with multiple use cases and then we're going to switch gears and take an uh, example of a a very valid use case that we're all dealing with, which is healthcare. Um, it's evolving at a rapid pace. And right now with, you know, post pandemic era, uh, it's uh, even more important for us to have uh, the, all the tools available to make progress so that we can do the right level of uh, sequencing, identify the right levels of cure and deploy them at scale uh, to the masses. So uh, we're going to dive into healthcare next, and then I will basically stop there for any questions you might have. And then lastly, I'm going to focus on any major challenges um, that we face today in the field of federated learning in particular, and uh, leave you with my thoughts and some of the questions that are uh, being tackled live uh, as we research this technology more and more. Um, so with that, um, I don't have 
a ton of text. So uh, bear with me here. I only have visuals in this presentation uh, mostly, but um, hopefully, you know, it's gonna make more clear as we tie it all in. And if there's any questions, definitely feel free to interrupt me. So um, in this graphic, as you can see, um, AI is evolving all the fields. And, and with you know the post-pandemic era, we've seen a lot of challenges. Obviously, we've seen you know, a virus that's taken down our economy. Um, it's um, also uh, caused a lot of travel restrictions. A lot of uh, the people out here in the US might actually relate to it right now. Um, and also it's, you know, it's become more and more important to detect things early and make sure we are, you know, having things uh, such as, you know, surveillance technologies or uh, detection technologies in place um, across the board um, that will help us detect things early and prevent them. Um, we've also seen supply chain bottlenecks. Um, where we see this, uh, you know, rise of drone technologies and other smart logistics, uh, including robotics, that's helping, um, you know, the ease up the supply chain and also make sure that we are able to get the necessary supplies uh, in emergency situations across um, where you know traditional um, supply chain cannot serve those needs. So um, there's a lot of uh, areas evolving, not just healthcare, but we've seen uh, self-driving come um, more and more into the picture where it's not a five to 10 year horizon technology anymore. It's more of a, a, you know, more of a technology that uh, evolving at a rapid pace now so that we can get to robot taxis, which is robots on wheels without drivers. That way we can all be socially uh, distant uh, reduce the risk of spread and have people be transported effectively between you know destinations without um, you know um, having you know human inter intervention and reducing the risk of accidents and so on and so forth. So um, right from recommender systems all the way to you know supply chain uh, logistics management to healthcare, genomic sequence studies, and uh, making sure we have the right level of cure and vaccinations out there at a faster pace. Um, this is evolving you know, uh, across the board. And um, a very important field of AI uh, that's under research for a few years now um, has come up in terms of uh, you know, uh, not just like product deployment, but also training. So uh, it's not only helping inferencing with respect to applications such as like, you know, keyboard patterns on your smartphones, uh, but it's more of a, you know, how we can improve the training environments and make them better. And data in this economy becomes more and more important. So wh while we want privacy, we also want to learn from these different environments. So the biggest challenges we see in terms of, um, you know, any kind of camera technology, let's say, um, we see that uh, the learning models learn best locally with respect to a certain constraint in place. And also it all depends on what the camera uh, uh, orientations are. So for instance, a drone that you see in the picture here might have a camera in the front detecting, um, you know, a fisheye scene. Uh, but if you want, um, to use all of that data and apply it to a, a, a drone tech or a car um, that actually has cameras in different orientations, it can lead to um, your model breaking or you know your learning parameters not really translating directly from one use case to the other. So federated learning really helps there where you have a pre-trained model that's uh, being deployed across use cases. So uh, in my example, I'm gonna take a very simple example of drone delivery. It can be either um, you know, a delivery in from warehouse one to warehouse two, where you actually have um, a robot which is flying, uh, going from um, warehouse A to warehouse B, and it's collecting data while it's going between these two warehouses. And then you have another use case where there is a robot, which is similar to this drone robot, but 
it's actually navigating and mapping a scene inside of a warehouse. Now, these are very similar uh, use cases. That is, you know, taking obstacles, which are these packages from point A to point B, but the environments are very, very different. So how can we learn from one environment and apply the uh, learnings or, you know, the, get the data from one to the other? That's where federated learning helps, where you can actually um, have one model, which is catering to a particular use case, where this use case could be um, actually taking something from one place to the other. It involves tracking an object, picking it up, as, you know, uh, really uh, making sure that this particular package obstacle is different from the other obstacle that the robot is going to encounter along the way and ensuring it safely delivers it to the uh, destination. So in this particular use case, we have a pre-trained model that we would like to deploy, and we would like to deploy it both on the drone as well as on the robot that's being, you know, uh, mapping the warehouse environment in, indoors. And to do so, we actually have camera technologies that are different on these two robots. Their orientations are different, their field of views are different, and so the data coming in from there is different. However, the characteristics that we see in the data, for instance, you know, detection of the obstacles, that's same. Um, we also have one goal, which is to detect the package and lift it, whereas avoid all the other obstacles um, and so that's going to be the same whether you're using a drone deck to go from you know warehouse A to B versus mapping things out of the warehouse. So federated learning really helps here, where um, anything that we learn from camera technologies on the drone can actually translate to the camera technologies in the robot that's navigating uh, inside of the warehouse space. Um, and the way we do that is we actually keep the data private on both of these robots. Uh, we have uh, both of these robots learning locally and informing the model. And then we have the master model in the cloud where we are able to um, apply necessary pruning, aggregate all of the learning, which is you know the weights, and then we update the global model with all of the things that we've learned. So uh, this field is, you know, going beyond recommender systems, beyond, you know, word completion on your smartphone, but also applying to technologies that are used in supply chain or even in healthcare. Uh, the biggest challenge actually that, uh, that uh, enterprise AI uh, is facing is different sensor modalities. So we talked about one sensor modality, which was the camera, which is being heavily used in robots. Uh, when we talk about healthcare, um, you're using different sensors and not just cameras, but you have other detection center sensors like ultrasound, you have digital pathology, um, you know, sequencing and microscopy. So all of those sensors provide different uh, layers of data. Uh, and each of that is useful to us uh, in order for us to form an understanding of um, how our human biology is and it also informs um, vaccines and cures. So it's extremely important for us to um, see what we can learn from different sensor modalities in a particular research setting and apply it into a different setting, such as a hospital. So uh, with that, I want to actually dive deeper into you know, the healthcare use case and use that as a specific example um, to see how we can apply federated learning, how we can improve and accelerate the pace of um, algorithm development when we are using these different sensor modalities and really making um, the data a decentralized commodity where we don't really have to have access to the data. But with that, you know, with the access of those weights, we can uh, improve our models and scale the deployment. Um, so in a typical environment, you'd see, uh, you know, that there's uh, diverse like resources all across. We talked about um, a lot of uh, 
the uh, different sensors being used in uh, healthcare facilities. Uh, there's different output sensors also, such as you know displays. You have robots, surgical robots that are assisting uh, the uh, nurses, patients um, in in terms of you know like uh, the uh, surgery itself and uh, making sure that you know they are able to augment the experience uh, for doctors. So uh, while the doctors are going to be in surgery, they are getting these augmented information through these displays or these robotic arms to assist them around, and especially becomes important when nurses are helping patients. And so um, there's two levels of modalities. One is sensor modalities, which is uh, the input, and the other is the output that um, we usually have, like, you know, different kinds of SLAs tied to, which is service level agreements. So now when we talk about, like, having service level agreements at a hospital, um, they have high compute, uh, you know, specific needs. We have a lot of outputs and time to market becomes more and more crucial. So how can we, um, you know, inform these deployment and help accelerate these deployments and, um, you know, um, use the search that's ongoing either in research facilities or some of the hospitals that are partnered with uh, research institutes and universities across the board. Um, that's where we have to make sure that we uh, you know don't use any legacy hardware and software platforms but try to decentralize such that we are able to use the best hardware and best software technologies that are available across the board so that's where federated learning comes in where you no, don't not only have a local model that you're training but you're able to inform the model uh, in a deploying facility like a hospital uh, from the best in class research that's been happening in research institutions and it basically helps evolve the whole field at a rapid pace um, then we talk about like workflows so today we have hospital ecosystems that have different workflows uh, yes they are massive workloads and there's a lot of standardization but what we see here is even in the field of digital pathology there's a lot of fragmenting where uh, different sensor uh, types and different um, you know company standards are being used by you know different hospitals so they have their own level of uh, encryption their own level of uh, rendering and visualization of these uh, proteins and you know are like uh, body constituency um, so managing and making sure that we are able to deploy these technologies at a scale um, and you know enables us to actually make progress at a faster rate and so we need to make sure that um, we have something uh, like more uh, like more diverse to handle all of the use cases that these complex workflows have and then lastly, we talked a little bit about like a fragmented space in uh, healthcare. It, it particularly leads to fractured deployment cycles because uh, when you have you know, fragmentation at a sensor input level or even on your output level where you're showing some of the renderings and learning and visualizing you know, from them, uh, it really adds an operational overhead uh, for the AIS to be deployed because you have to like you know go through those extra hoops to uh, make sure you know you are uh, deploying it for that particular hospital environment so having federated learning here helps because uh, it really makes sh sure that the model itself is standardized you're using a pre-trained standard model to tackle a particular use case once you've chosen that um, you're able to you know, update that model with the data you have and also get the best of what's out there. Where if, you know, and that's across the uh, different sensor domains you're playing with and also across different outputs that you might want to use that with. So with that, um, I'm going to jump into you know, some of the uh, major uh, challenges that the industry itself has been facing. Uh, it's been happening before the pandemic, but uh, right after the pandemic hit, this is a report from Gartner that basically says 
53% of the projects that go into pilot actually make it to production in healthcare. That means 50% of the projects that are happening in the healthcare space, while they are promising, they're being rejected and not being used. This is basically how like, you know, innovation is happening in the field of healthcare. Like you literally just throwing half of the projects that are being worked on and the complexity of the AI solutions that are being integrated into most of these medical solutions is a huge barrier because the infrastructure that's being designed today in healthcare facilities, it's actually uh, catering to um, non-AI based or non-data based approaches where they kind of revert to standard practices and legacy compute legacy hardware and legacy software uh, approaches. And that basically leads to only 30% of those projects that are you know, data-driven being able to make it to the hospitals and being deployed. And lastly, because of 30% uh, you know, of the projects being making it, actually a very small pool, uh, but you think of security and privacy, it's uh, a matter of life and death and you know safety becomes critical so due to all of those safety security and privacy concern 30 percent of those actually make it to the final deployment stage so given there's so much rejection at each and every step uh, there's these great ideas that go into pilot but aren't able to make it leading to these one to two year development cycles we've seen um, where you know it takes a long time for us to sequence and you know come up with a vaccine, for example, if we take uh, COVID as an example. So uh, with that, you know the approach that we're going to take with, with federated learning is to be able to make sure we are having a standardized approach. We choose a pre-trained model that works best for a particular use case. And then we store it globally where we have organizations and standardizations around it such that we have a body that's uh, following the model and making sure the updates are actually approved. And that, in that manner, we are able to get all of the hospitals to contribute, all of the research organizations to contribute and hopefully lead to higher number of ideas making it. Um, I think one of the biggest challenge which is still going to haunt us is the complexity of the solution. So the piece that you see in the middle, which is where you know 70% of the ideas get rejected, only 30% make it, are due to the complexity. And that is something that's gonna evolve um, as we make our healthcare solutions better and better. But the first and the third, which is you know related to uh, the uh, adoption of AI technology and also uh, security and privacy concern, those two are definitely tackled with uh, federated learning. So with that, um, I would like to uh, focus on a particular use case and then maybe break for a few minutes if uh, people have any questions. So um, for, all you, for all those who you don't know, federated learning is basically utilizing you know, different um, learning waves, uh, or I would say basically the updated models that have been learned on specific local data sets across different entities. So the picture you see here on the right is the host different hospital entities. Um, they could be like hospitals deploying solutions, uh, whereas some hospitals could be research facilities that are actually doing cutting edge research where things are not deployable yet but uh, we're still informing the model on a daily basis as we get more and more data and learn from it. So um, all of this that's happening across different entities can actually be aggregated together and that will help inform the global model, which is what you see on top. And so uh, what happens here is that you have your private data and you have a federated server that holds the global model. And what we're doing is we are constantly monitoring 
the updates to that global model. So this is gonna need some sort of governance, which is huge for um, use cases that are enterprise, um, you know, and it, it's it's basically important for us to govern them because it's being deployed uh, across different companies throughout the industry. So um, governance becomes a key role and that's why you need a, a specific federated server that's able to monitor this global model. Um, what you see is the three different facilities here are learning from the local data they're getting and updating their local models. Now, uh, the way we actually uh, communicate the uh, uh, communicate the updates is by communicating only the weights. So um, even though today we have uh, networking bottlenecks such as uh, you know low throughput or latency issues, um, since we have only weights being updated, we are not going to deal with a lot of latency here. So anything that's being um, you know trained and approved at a particular local facility can actually be uploaded to the network within seconds because it's just a small delta weight changes. Now, weight changes actually also come with bias based on whatever local data you might have. So there are certain pruning techniques that happen at the aggregation facility, uh, not in the federated server, outside of it, but while you're having that aggregation, you need to make sure that you apply a difference function as well as you're able to apply some pruning to it to make sure that the global model that is being trained is actually trained based on the you know uh, data and learning from all of the places and it doesn't have those bias from a particular local entity um, and then once we have this federated server uh, updating the model, we have governance applied to it. Uh, we see that there is a two-way encryption flow that's being put in place. There are a lot of encryption techniques uh, that are existing today. Um, as part of NVIDIA, we are looking at a few approaches that I might, I'll be diving deeper into once we talk about challenges with federated learning. Um, but here you see encryption blocks being in place such that when you have a global model updated, you want to get all of that goodness out to the field where, for instance, you learn something from a research facility, you want to actually deploy it. So once a particular change is approved and the global model is um, updated, you want to make sure that now becomes that new pre-trained model that a, a hospital, for instance, will actually deploy in their practices. Um, one of the uh, most important things um, when we you know, talk about this technology is encryption and uh, how can we really trust, whether we trust this server. Um, that's been a huge issue with um, you know, a lot of hospitals in the healthcare um, you know, use case. Also with uh, self-driving, there's different car companies trying to develop different solutions. So it's uh, very important that they trust uh, you know the uh, server with their uh, models because it's a very time-consuming process to collect all of the data in our models and deploy them. So it's natural that a research facility, which is you know doing research, um, is able to like safeguard their models that they've worked so hard on. Uh, similarly, a hospital environment that's actually deploying these facilities. Um, it becomes very important for them to not just protect their data, but also make sure that the changes that are coming in uh, don't bias their models um, in a way where um, you know it leads to um, something that's non-expecting. So um, there are uh, obviously it, it's a life and death uh, scenario with respect to healthcare. So we want to make sure that. We have all sorts of um, encryptions in place, not just for the data, but also for the model that's being trained. So there's this approach, which is homomorphic encryption that basically allows the uh, model to be trained on data that's been encrypted. So you don't have to actually decrypt the data that you're getting. 
um, when you're able to uh, share the weights and update your model, you don't necessarily need to decrypt it for you to be able to uh, train your data. You can still train based on the encrypted data. And whatever training parameters you come up with after your training is done, when you decrypt it, it would be the same as learning on decrypted data. So this is uh, an approach um, is being um, used heavily uh, in you know, blockchain. It's also being used heavily in other networking offload, whether it's like data plane uh, networking or control plane networking. So um, this is something that we are able to uh, take from the networking field and use it with the model development flow that we have in federated learning. So that way, uh, we are able to fully trust the federated server for any of the updates that we get from the global model. And a federated server is also able to trust all of the updates uh, that we're getting from the respective local model. So that's uh, something that we are bringing in. I'm uh, super excited to um, introduce uh, NVIDIA's Flare technology, which we release. There's blogs and videos out there that I'm going to link that are uh, released um, you know, last week and this week. Um, we teased it at um, our global technology conference, which is the largest AI conference now for healthcare AI. And um, you know, there's uh, basically a lot of these practices that we talked about, including you know, examples for federated learning uh, that are applicable not only to healthcare, but you can actually use those examples in use cases elsewhere as well. So um, um, after this, um, you can actually go and follow these links and sign up for Jupyter Notebooks or you know, NGC, which is NVIDIA's uh, cloud technology to actually play around with these examples and see what they're all about. But um, there's definitely homomorphic encryption and um, you know, federated learning that's being um, available as an open source tool for developers out there so that we can accelerate the you know, pace of improvements, uh, specifically in healthcare sector. Um, as you see here, um, you know, it's important for us to prov provide you know, any sort of uh, uh, like data privacy approaches. Uh, and privacy is not just to uh, protect the data, but also prevent it from leaking somewhere that that where it can be used for you know malicious intent. So differential privacy is something that's important that's baked in to federated learning practices. Uh, homomorphic encryption is the first time uh, something of uh, networking uh, field we're bringing into the field of AI with uh, you know ag aggregation of encrypted models where you don't really need to. Uh, encrypt the models to be able to inform the local models. You can actually do a lot of training and inferencing with encrypted data that you're getting, which in this case, it's going to be the delta weights. And then lastly, we uh, obviously have a, a full stack of technology with you know Monai uh, and, and linked all the way through PyTorch and TensorFlow so that people who are already familiar with PyTorch TensorFlow technologies, they can um, use the standard Python package for easy integration into the code base. Um, you can also use Monai for training, which is uh, something that's extremely powerful for recommender systems and uh, even healthcare. For uh, instance, when we have uh, two particular uh, cancer types, one is brain tumor and the other can be breast cancer, they can actually be linked together based on, you know, of leveraging learnings from one and applying it to the other. And so um, this is something which Monai definitely helps with. It's a very powerful um, you know, training approach. And that is also powered with the federated learning frameworks. So we have been able to uh, blend in uh, all of these key technologies and provide that uh, you know, in terms of Clara uh, train and Clara uh, inferencing uh, technologies that we released this week. So it's all public. There's public YouTube links that I can share with um, Ashwarya and the rest of the forum. And um, if you have any questions or want to learn more, definitely reach out to me. 
um, we can certainly talk more about, uh, you know, uh, homomorphic encryption and privacy in general. Um, so with that, I would like to pause here. Um, I know there's a lot to digest. Um, also, there's, um, you know, different use cases we jumped. Um, we spoke about uh, robotics and supply chain. Um, we then jumped into, you know, self-driving for a little bit and then talked about healthcare specifically. So um, if there is any questions, Ashwarya, uh, or anything that, you know, people would like to know specifically, um, I can handle that and then we can move on to the challenges. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Amit. So uh, when you were mentioning about the privacy part, right, like when the data is being actually connect collected from different channels, how does that get addressed? Because uh, through federated learning, we are uh, training the models more on like on a centralized, uh, like the platform where the models are being trained is centralized, whereas the data is decentralized. So how does the uh, how does the data privacy concept uh, like how is how is that like measured? So there is definitely two ways of handling it. End-to-end -end encryption is one where you ensure that your um, data plane is end-to-end -end encrypted and you never have to decrypt it. So a local research facility, um, let's say a Stanford VA hospital um, here in Palo Alto um, is doing some cutting edge research. They're actually um, using local data to inform models and improve the performance. And um, you get to a certain specificity that you don't want to lose. So you are able to send encrypted information, which is end-to-end -end encryption. So your data is not going anywhere. You own the data with encryption. And you also, with federal learning, obviously you're only sending the weights, but you send those weights encrypted as well. So this end-to-end -end encryption helps you know, protect the data because the other site, which is the global model you know, in the federated server, does not need decrypted data. With homomorphic encryption, you don't need to decrypt the data to actually learn from it. You can learn encrypted data. Mm -hmm. And your learning is going to be equivalent to um, you know, what it would have been had you actually decrypted it. So given that you have the keys of protecting your data and you've locked it, and you've not provided the keys, to uh, either a federated server or any other you know, facility out there that might be using all of that uh, learning, um, uh, it basically ensures that your data is private. Um, and that's one of the key challenges that we've been facing in the last uh, five years in this field. And finally, in the last couple of years, we've been able to um, you know, ensure that we have that end-to-end -end yeah. encryption. Yeah. The, sec uh, the second thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, talking about differential privacy. So um, patient data is actually extremely critical and there are standardized policies around, you know, sharing this patient data. So uh, we definitely want to have technologies in place that prevent that data leakage. So um, we have to ensure that the data plane is completely separate from the control plane. Uh, and what I mean by that is your data plane is in a data lake, which is absolutely secure. You don't need access to that data plane for you to update or inform your model. You can actually use control planes, which are um, you know control parameters, either your loss functions, weight, or whatever have. Um, you can use the control planes to communicate that. And since you have that separation, you really are able to prevent any data leakage that could happen um, as a result of uh, you know sharing um, the information and models around. I hope I was able yeah. to answer that question. Yeah, that does. Uh, also, another thing uh, that we wanted to like understand is when we have uh, the, the federated learning um, use case that you were mentioning about is addressing if the different rows of data is being stored at different entities, right? Uh, that's that's basically what we are trying to do here. But in case we have, um, let's say we have different departments within the same organization, 
who might may be storing different features so as a patient like my data could be stored in uh, three to four departments in a hospital right so each yeah. department might not have access to all the all the information about me so maybe right. orthopedic department has more information about my uh, health history versus the other department might not so in that kind of a situation we end up using a vertical federated learning approach so could you maybe uh, give a little more insight about that approach so uh, certainly there's definitely you know uh, uh, treatment cycles uh, that are different across different domains so when you talk about digital pathology it could be very different from um, any kind of like ct or you know endoscopy ultrasound scanning and the amount of data that you need to make progress um, in a particular domain is different across these domains so the way we would like to handle it is we have a federated server for each of those domains because it does not make sense to have a centralized federated model um, and a server uh, across different use cases when you actually have uh, different data requirements so um, let's say ultrasound has a much different data requirement and it's much smaller compared to you know cancer growth cells or you know um, ct scanning environment so in that particular approach the way we uh, use vertical federated learning is to be able to identify the use case uh, it's often going to be bound around certain constraints so uh, the first uh, you know uh, objective is to identify your constraint you're working with so for instance uh, in ultrasound um, there are uh, like a few vendors that um, actually supply ultrasound equipment so uh, i'm just uh, giving an ex example uh, hypothetically speaking let's say there are x uh, number of uh, standards out there you aggregate all of those x standards you build up a constraint and make sure your data is following those constraints and you collect the data based on that and you have a have your federated server set up in such a way that your model is only going to be updated with that data domain so ultrasound um, models are going to be different from ct scanning models and we would like to keep them separated through these vertical federated servers um, that way we are not just you know getting into the situ situation where there's data leakage mm -hmm. um, but we are also able to you know um, utilize our compute cycles more efficiently you don't need um, a lot of data from ct scanning if you're only going to be uh, you know looking at uh, ultrasound fidelity mm -hmm. you know uh, data where you're making decisions on whether your lungs have you know a certain uh, uh infiltration and that's much easier to see with uh, like less amount of data or less fidelity data mm -hmm. so think of uh, compute cycles where you're actually having less compute cycles be spent um, because you only need a specific fidelity or specific uh, amount of data and um, you're actually protecting your compute cycles as well as your data through that um, and that's becoming more and more popular because nowadays with you know decentralization you have data of all kinds and um, it's always good to learn from you know um, la because lack of data is a problem so it's always important to learn from data that you don't have but uh, in that process we often can get lost and even you know uh, disrupt some of the learning uh, that we've done on our models by getting the wrong data because you know garbage in garbage out if uh, you have uh, certain high fidelity data that it's not too useful for your use case um, you're certain to run into you know issues and you've also you know done some over computing so you've lost compute cycles as well so vertical federated learning that way helps keep uh, you know all of these use cases more streamlined and contained got it so uh with with like uh, a 
uh, a package like Clara, like that you mentioned that in, in media has launched. Um, is it open source or is there any kind of proprietary technology involved with it? So um, the uh, NVIDIA Flare that we launched, which is yeah. federated learning, uh, that's open source. Uh, you can learn more about it and um, you know you can get started with uh, Jupyter Notebooks, examples, and um, we also have a GitHub. Um, the Clara is more of a proprietary, it's uh, you know bundled with a compute technology uh, which is, you know, our end-to-end -end stack. So you not just you're not just turning the SDKs, but you're also using um, the hardware uh, computing platform that can accelerate the SDK. So um, that is more proprietary, but there are components such as federated learning and parts of the SDK that are open. Okay, got it. So uh, with explaining this, right? Like we see that with federated learning, not just that we're getting better data, we're getting more data, we are also training it in uh, in a decentralized manner. What would be uh, the reason that federated learning is taking the time it is taking to get productionized in industries? So is this only you know focused more on companies which are B2, B2C or can it also be utilized in B2B companies? That's a great question. I think that is a perfect segue into uh, you know the challenges that I want to talk to the talk through. Um, but just on a high level, I think uh, what we are seeing is these technologies being utilized heavily uh, with uh, mobile phones. There's millions of devices out there. There's like you know billions and trillions of uh, images that are being trained on. Um, so uh, we have a lot of data. We are able to utilize that to you know tag our photos better, improve our keyboard swiping experience, and all of that is actually much easier because um, even though we have GDPR and you know all the privacy laws in place, we actually don't have to deal with the data as such. Mm -hmm. We uh, can make like small weight adjustments on a daily basis from millions of nodes, which are these millions of smartphones out there. Um, and it's fairly straightforward. Uh, but when it comes to enterprise AI, specifically, you know, um, uh, an industry that's fragmented, uh, such as, you know, healthcare or, you know, self-driving robotics, um, there are certain standards that dominate, which are, you know, decided by regulatory bodies. And that's part of one part of the reason where we have to create duration. We have to ensure you know, intellectual property rights are being respected because a, a research organization that's worked very hard to develop certain technologies and models, um, you know, there are certain uh, IP rights that are associated with the data, with you know, the control plane, the way they're updating these models um, and the approaches they're coming up with. Um, and the way they're going to be uh, collecting the data and the type of data that could be, you know, utilized to uh, maybe provide more insights, right, compared to other organizations out there. So there's there a certain set of like IP rights we have to have uh, rules around. Um, that way we can protect them better and respect them. Um, there's obviously, you know, institutional boards that need to be set up because you want to ensure that you're monitoring that federated server. Um, where the global model sits and you're able to you know update it in a meaningful way such that you don't regress um, you're definitely making you know upward progress trying to learn from different places and there's um, certain standards around it um, there's a lot about you know um, ethics in AI uh, and how can we make you know trustworthy AI that's maybe a topic of um, for another day where I can deep dive into what does you know trustworthy AI look like five to ten years from now. Um, so that's also one of the big pieces that's being uh, discussed when we talk about um, you know using federated learning approaches in you know industries because the impact of it is not just an improved keyboard. It's actually you know a matter of life and death or um, you know coming up with the next vaccine uh, ten months faster than the previous one, which can, you know, accelerate things at a much faster rate. So uh, there's definitely high risk reward here. So, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, things that are happening at a faster pace where some parts of federated learning have already 
made it to the mainstream. And that is how you see things like NVIDIA Flare become open source tools for developers out there to play around with. Um, but there's still a long way to go with respect to you know creating a federation, navigating the whole enterprise AI space. So I hope that you know that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Amit, for this. So, uh, are, is there any uh, other like kind of uh, use cases that you're going to be mentioning today? Um, so those are all the use cases. But I would like to probably just take a minute to touch on um, the. Uh, three challenges that we were not able to talk about. So sure. uh, one of the most important uh, challenge we spoke about was creating a federation. That's what's taking us uh, so long to um, get to the finish line or get over that inflection point where we can see massive adoption of this technology. Um, but there's some other key challenges that are pertinent to um, you know, AI in general which is centered around models and data, and also make sure we have the right ML ops to support this. So uh, model selection becomes extremely important because um, you have different uh, you know, entities like a research organization that's far ahead of what's being uh, deployed today in the real world environments in a hospital. So when you think of selecting a model, um, you have to ensure that uh, you select it in such a way that it's uh, going to be progressive and forward-looking, but it also takes into account the uh, real-world use case that a particular hospital would be dealing with. So this can lead to uh, conflicts often where um, as a hospital who's been using a model, you know, um, at a regular basis, you know, maybe daily to predict something, and um, you don't want to just change and swap it out. Um, you want to uh, make sure that you know it's more robust. That way, you know it's being used in production environment um, on a daily basis, and it's been through that rigor. Uh, research organizations, on the other hand, are doing models um, that are uh, more forward-looking but haven't been as rigorously tested. So selecting something. Um, becomes uh, key challenges. And uh, it's actually, we just spoke about two um, entities, like two types of entities, where a research organization and a hospital. There's so many different types of entities uh, when it comes to, you know, a complicated field like healthcare. So you can only imagine like, you know, how many brainstorming cycles and discussions will go into selecting a particular model. So that becomes, you know, one of the big pieces or, you know, huge hurdle that one needs to cross um, before we can make this more, you know, uh, like uh, ad ad adoption worldwide. Um, the other thing is data, uh, you know, is uh, key to ensuring we learn at a faster pace and we're able to utilize, uh, the, you know, different entities uh, and update that global model. But uh, again, when we talk about data, there's different types of data streams coming in and each entity is collecting data differently. So having standardization across you know, these uh, different entities to ensure they're all collecting it in a standard format helps reduce those fractured environments we looked at earlier, where um, you know, there's a disconnect between the way data was collected and the way a uh, local model was uh, evolved um, you know, from one entity to the other. And lastly, all of this cannot happen if we don't have, you know, compatible IT infrastructure, um, which means, you know, having a standardized best practices in the ML ops space that can actually support this at, you know, high throughput, low latency, and, um, you know, it's standardized to a point where it's, uh, you know, the updates are almost instant um, without any barriers. So. Those are big pieces that are also being work, worked on. And um, I would like to say that, you know, there's a, a lot more challenges um, that we see today um, in the field of federated learning that we need to get through to have wide adoption of this technology. 
Great. Thank you so much, Amit, for sharing this uh, this really uh, amazing deck. So would you also be uh, like, uh, can you also like send me this deck so I can add this in the description of the video when sure. we are posting this on YouTube? Absolutely, so uh, yeah. yeah. So people who are attending us live in case you were uh, unable to catch the entire session or if anybody wants to uh, re-listen to this session, they can uh, do that uh, on YouTube. So this video will be hosted on YouTube and uh, along with the resources and deck that Amit was sharing. So uh, Amit, if there's any other resources or any links that you would like to add to it, please feel free to do that. And uh, you'll be able to access this otherwise. Uh, great. And I think that's all the questions that we had for today. Um, this was amazing. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Amit. Uh, this was really helpful. And thank you for spending so much time and explaining each and everything uh, nicely. And uh, it also helped us more to understand the use case better with the, with the real world examples that you mentioned. So this was really helpful. Thank you so much for your time. And if you guys have any other questions that you might have after uh, revisiting the session or from the deck that uh, Amit is going to be sharing, please feel free to put that in the comments of the YouTube video as well. We will be uh, going back to the video and looking at the comments that you guys are making. So thank you so much and stay safe. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, Ashwarya, for organizing. And uh, I would just like to say if there's any questions, uh, leave them in the comments. Uh, I can answer them as I see. And definitely share resources along Stack. That way, you can look up open source tools and uh, get to play with some of them. And also, uh, you know, be more familiar with enterprise use cases. If uh, any of you are interested in B two B or enter enterprise wide AI adoption. Great. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Amit. Have a good yeah. one. Bye bye.